The day before Thanksgiving in 1971, a man identifying himself as Dan Cooper bought a plane ticket from Portland to Seattle. He hijacked the plane claiming he had a bomb in his briefcase and demanded $200,000 in four parachutes. He jumped out of the plane with the money and the bomb somewhere over the Pacific Northwest, never to be seen again. The FBI claims to have investigated over a thousand people, including dozens of deathbed confessions. In 2016, 45 years after the hijacking, the FBI suspended its investigation of the case. While the FBI is no longer looking for D.B. Cooper, there is a community of people who are trying to solve the case on their own. Welcome to the Cooper Vortex. In this episode, we're lucky to have Tom K. Tom is a scientist specializing in spectroscopy, which has led him to projects in paleontology and astronomy, among other things. He is the director of the Foundation for Scientific Advancement, lead researcher at the Burke Museum in Seattle, and has countless other fancy titles. If I were to read you all his credentials, the intro would be longer than the show. To sum it all up, he's the real deal. When Tom's not digging up Chinese feathered dinosaurs or searching for extrasolar planets, he's looking into D.B. Cooper. As far as I know, the only forensic work done on the case was done by Tom. His work is often cited in the Vortex, on the forums, in books, on TV, and even on this show. I know you'll enjoy this episode with my friend, Tom K. Well, let's go ahead and get started with how did you get sucked into the Cooper Vortex, Tom? How did I get sucked into the Cooper Vortex? Well, that was so long ago that we didn't call it the Cooper Vortex. So uh, back in 2007, Larry Carr, special agent of the FBI, Larry Carr, uh, came to the Seattle office, was transferred into the Seattle office, and he had a long time fascination with the D.B. Cooper case. So he was super excited to go to that office and work on it. So he told his boss that he wanted to work on the case. And the boss said, no, we don't waste our time on, on cases this old. Uh, so Larry thought about it for a bit and then negotiated with his boss and said, well, okay, if I can't work on it, how about if we release a bunch of information to the public and let them work on it? So his boss grudgingly uh, agreed, and that's when the modern world of Cooper started. So what he did was he released information that had never been public before, like transcripts and the fact that there was a tie was left on a plane and things like that. And the internet, as it's known to do, brought together all the people who were interested in Cooper and they formed uh, the Cooper Vortex, which we know it now. And they started talking about this new information in the Cooper case. Well, then adding to that, Larry Carr came to the forum that it was being discussed at and he added information directly at the forum. So for the first time, uh, the Cooper files had direct access to the FBI, which was very helpful. Were you so on the, in, the Cooper forum before No, then? no, not, not at the time. No, I'm not involved yet, right? This is the prequel to me getting oh, okay. involved. So uh, in one of the discussions on the forum, they were talking about the money being found on Tina Bar on the Columbia River in 1980. And they asked Larry Carr, they said, uh, has anybody ever analyzed the money? Larry Carr said no. And then they asked him the next question, which turned out to be pretty important. Would you let someone outside the FBI analyze the money? And uh, somewhat of a miracle, he said yes. So the Cooper people then went on a hunt to find a scientist who would analyze the money for them. And I'd like to say I was the first one that they called, but I wasn't. Uh, they actually called a bunch of people uh, and they all said no. Uh, then they finally got around to me, and I was the only idiot to say yes. So what I thought was going to be a couple of week project analyzing the money has kind of turned into a decade long endeavor in analyzing the Cooper case. So that's how it happened. What did you know about the case before that point? Well, uh, you know, growing up, I'd heard about it growing up as a kid. I didn't know too much about it. I knew a guy jumped out of a plane with a bunch of money. But really, most of the details uh, were not familiar with to me at all. So initially, I spent a lot of time, and uh, they were going over all these details on the forum. And just reading the forum, which eventually ended up being thousands of pages, you could get a pretty clear idea of what the whole uh, thing was with Cooper and where the issues were and where the interesting bits and pieces were. And what's interesting about the Cooper case is that 
there's a lot of facts in the case that could go both ways, and that's why people find it fascinating. Because, for instance, was he an experienced parachuter or not? He put on the parachute uh, like he knew what he was doing, and he threw away the instruction cards, but he jumped with... Uh, with shoes on instead of boots and, and no you know professional skydiver would jump with regular shoes on, etc. So there's a lot of enigmas in the case that people love to examine and try and understand it. Oh, many. Mm-hmm. So when they asked you to analyze the money, what, what was the first thing you did? Well, uh, you know, when they asked before the money even got here and they, they kind of rolled up in the black SUV, they hand carried the money from the Seattle office to my lab here in, in Arizona. I did a bunch of research on the money and found out what had happened. It had been buried in the sand for you know, presumably many, many years, which was kind of actually up my alley because most of what I do in science is paleontology. And paleontology is the study of things that have been buried in the ground for a long time. So while it may seem odd at first, they really are pretty well connected. Uh, and looking into the, the history on the bills, we can see from the uh, news reels and news publications at the time that the bills were very degraded around the edges. And then there were some black bills among the, uh, the, the good bills where you could actually see the, the text and the graphics on the, on the bills. So the first thing we said was, why are some of these bills black? And uh, we kind of speculated on the idea. At this point, I put together a team, I should note, uh, of two other people, Carol Abrazinskis, who was a scientific illustrator at that time from the University of Chicago. She's now at the University of Michigan. And Alan Stone, who runs a metallurgy lab in Chicago. So they joined me kind of on this hunt. And uh, looking at this thing, we identified the black bills as being interesting because something turned them black. So we requested from the FBI that we get some of the normal bills and some of the black ones. So we then uh, went into a big investigation as to what turned the bills black. And uh, that turned out to be several months and several dead ends. Uh, we originally, the black turned out to be silver on the bills. And then we looked into the geology of the area and what would potentially be in the water of the Columbia River. Turns out there were silver mines upstream of the Columbia River. So we were looking for a methodology that would apply, get the silver out of the water and onto the bills, which was turned out to be pretty complex. <laughs> yeah. But uh, throughout our investigation here, we ended up talking to some other people. We ended up talking to an FBI agent who said, well, back in the 70s, we used to use silver nitrate to turn the bill uh, to do fingerprint, uh, find fingerprints on stuff. And he said, we put the silver nitrates, what they use on black and white uh, pictures, so they would put the silver nitrate on and the fingerprints would turn black first and they would take a picture of it. And then the whole thing would turn black from exposure to the light. So it was kind of like turning on the light in the dark room and you kill your picture. So uh, that's where that ended. <laughs> so the, the, the hope that the silver would be something didn't turn out to be too much. But we did some other experiments and found out that uh, money in packets does not float. It ro- goes to the bottom of the river. A lot of people thought it floated downriver. Mm-hmm. We also found out that the money could not have made it th- through washing down rivers from the aerial jump area into the Columbia River and onto Tina Bar. There was no waterways that connect those two. And that was another FBI kind of announced thing that said, well, we think that the money, he died and the money rolled into a river and it got washed downstream, ended up on Tina Bar. We found out that didn't happen. So uh, we did several other experiments, but it was pretty much uh, all the things that they said were true about the money on Tina Bar turned out to be not the case. And so how do you think the money ended up on Tina Bar? How did the money end up on Tina Bar? Well, that is the million dollar question these days. Yeah, we eliminated all the natural possibilities. So that leaves very few things left. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody put the money on Tina Bar although that's the first conclusion that everybody jumps to. Uh, What our research shows is that there was no natural means to get the money from the aerial jump area to Tina Bar. So could it have been human? Yes. Could it have been something else we can't speculate about? Yes. But it is one of the most interesting unanswered questions in the Cooper case. Were you working with Jerry Thomas on uh, the Washougal washdown theory? 
So Jerry Thomas is a, a longtime Cooper guy, and he spent most of his life investigating the area uh, around Ariel and in the Washougal River. And his theory was that uh, the Cooper bailed out somewhere uh, further east of the center of the flight path than the FBI had. And he spent decades looking in the woods for Cooper's body. And uh, he originally came with us on one of our trips when we made our first trip out to the area, him being the local expert, he, uh, he was with us and kind of showed us around. So uh, we, we found uh, his help useful, but after that, we didn't really do much with Jerry. As I read, you guys did an interesting test where you put a, a bundle of $51 bills together and put your phone number on it and threw it in the river. And then 18 months later, somebody called you. Yeah. You know, this was one of the more interesting tests that we did. So when you're going to be scientific about this, you know, you don't try and jump to a conclusion first and then do an experiment to prove your conclusion. So we didn't know, you know, we didn't know if money floated. We didn't know how far money would go downstream. Uh, so we went out there and we attached a pile of, uh, I think it was like $21 bills. We put a rubber band around it. And we put a fishing line on it. And we threw it in the creeks up in the Washougal area and wanted to see how far or how fast it would move down river. Turned out it didn't, wouldn't go anywhere. So uh, kind of out of frustration, uh, what we did was we printed up several ID cards, uh, giving my name and phone number and offering a reward and we sealed them in plastic. And then we took uh, the $21 bills and we wrapped it in a rubber band and under the rubber band, we put the ID card and we threw three or four of these into various places along the Washougal River. And I gotta tell you, everybody was laughing at us in the Cooper world that we did this saying, well, you're just throwing your money away in the river. That's all you're doing. You know, just throwing your money away. Well, sure enough, more than a year later, some kid uh, was wading in the water and saw this card thing in the, and picked it up and he called us and we got a recovery and the, the, that the rubber bands were gone. The money was gone. The uh, ID card survived intact because it was sealed in plastic. Uh, but it only went not like a, a mile or two down river. So it didn't travel very far, even in a year and a half by itself, if that's the way it traveled. So what that told us was that the idea of the washdown theory really was just made up and had no basis in fact. So we completely discounted the Washougal washdown theory at that point. You also did a bunch of experiments on the rubber bands around the money at Tina Bar. Because when Brian Ingram pulled it out, of the ground, he said the rubber bands were intact, but crumbled instantly. Do I have that correct? Yeah, that's exactly correct. And that is a very big point because rubber bands, we, we can do experiments and we kind of know already the lifetime of a rubber band. So a rubber band has got sulfur in it. And the sulfur is what makes a rubber band stretchy. So if you leave a rubber band out exposed to air, the oxygen in the air will combine with the sulfur and the sulfur will actually leave the rubber material. And that's why if you leave a rubber band on a doorknob, it becomes brittle and breaks away. But if you put your rubber bands in a plastic bag in a drawer, they tend to do pretty good for a long time. So we knew just from the chemistry that rubber bands will not survive in the wild very long. So we did some more research and we found the rubber band manufacturer who was still in business that was producing like 80 or 90 percent of the rubber bands uh, for the country back in the 70s. That's amazing. So we talked, yeah, we talked to the research chemist there and he was fascinated. You know, that's one good thing about Cooper is every time you talk to somebody, they're fascinated by it. So he did a little research and he came up with the most likely formula for the rubber bands that they still use today that they were using in, in the early 70s at the time of Cooper, and they said, here you go, you know, this is the best formula. He goes, and by the way, we probably su uh, supplied the rubber bands to the bank that used the, that bundled the money up because we supplied all the banks on the West Coast at that time. So he had some real fabulous information there. So we are very, pretty darn sure that we got the right rubber bands. So what we did was we took some of these rubber bands and we made a, a plastic sheet and we stretched them around this sheet 
at different uh, stretches. You know, we stretched some 50%, some 75%, some 100%. And we took these, uh, these plastic plates with the rubber bands stretched around them, and we put one in water here in Arizona. We put another one under the sand about a couple miles away from Tina Bar in somebody's backyard. Uh, so we had a real good idea. We also had some in the laboratory, and we waited to see how long it would take. We, we went back and, and looked at them occasionally to see what was happening with rubber bands. And basically within three or four months, all the rubber bands had disintegrated and broke. So we know that the lifetime of rubber bands out in the wild is, is less than a year for sure, probably less than six months. So the idea that the money would wa wash down the river, unless you could get it from the aerial Washington area uh, to, to Tina Bar within a month, which is pretty unrealistic, no matter how you talk about it, uh, you wouldn't be able to have the rubber bands intact. So that tells us that that money went into the ground very soon after the hijacking and probably remained there for the entire duration. And this goes against the theories produced by the FBI in the Palmer report that said, oh, the money must have been dredged up from the bottom of the river and thrown up on the beach. That's really not congruent with our findings on the rubber band. Hmm. I don't think I've ever heard anybody do so much science on rubber bands before. Well, that's what you have to do if you want to get the real answers. And then aside from uh, the FBI bringing you the money, you actually got access to a lot of the evidence the FBI has. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, as you, as you can imagine, the Cooper world is, is filled with a bunch of people who you wouldn't want to trust. <laughs> so, you know, we were in that category to start with, but then uh, after Larry Carr saw that we were pretty serious and we did a great job on the money and, uh, you know, we actually were doing real science, he then said, well, you guys can come on up to Seattle. He goes, and I'll let you in to the archive and I'll show you all the evidence we have. So that was a tremendous opportunity that really uh, no one else has ever had. Uh, so my team uh, went up there, and Jeff Gray was uh, kind of along for the ride at that time. He was writing the book on Cooper. And at that time, the FBI was very cooperative with people writing books. So he was there with us too. But we were able to see the entire archive, all the evidence that had been accumulated on Cooper. Now, what we didn't see, which turned out to be 90% of the evidence, was the investigations they did into uh, personal people. So according to Larry Carr, there was an eight foot tall and 10 foot long uh, shelving unit filled with uh, folders from all the people that they'd investigated for the Cooper case over the years. Now that was all personal information, so we didn't get to see that. But besides the personal information, he brought out boxes of stuff and the 302s which are only now coming to light. Uh, and the 302s are F the FBI's binder that has all the information and all the testimony and all the data in it. So we were able to, for two days, to pour through the 302s and look through all the physical evidence that they had there. And uh, that was tremendous. So we were the first ones to be able to do that outside the FBI. When the FBI uh, went out to Tina Bar to look into that money find, was there anything else that was found other than the the $5,800? No, no. You know, the only thing that was really found on Tina Bar was the money. There's a lot of arguments about the shards, you know, whether or not money was found buried three feet deep or not. Uh, I can tell you that a lot of people make a lot of to-do about that information, but the FBI, aren't, they're not archaeologists. They did not do a professional dig on the site where the money was found. They basically dug a hole looking for more money and they kind of people walking around everywhere. So there was almost no way that you couldn't mix the, the shards up in the sand and who knows if they fell down in the hole or whatever, wherever they found them. So uh, there was also discussion that there was a whole lot of shards that were found to the point where people were take, picking them up and taking them home. But contrary to that discussion, Looking in the FBI archive, there was only small fragments of, of, of money shards. There was not piles of, of money shards that had been recovered from Tina Bar. So the discussions from people who were there at the time and what we see as evidence in the FBI archive, uh, not the same. 
How do you believe the money ended up there, if you had to guess? I have no no explanation for how the money got there. Most likely, I think if I was going to speculate about it, uh, I could speculate that, you know, if, if Cooper hitchhiked out of the neighborhood, which is probably his only way out, uh, he may have bribed somebody, uh, you know, with some money to take him to the airport or something. Uh, and perhaps that guy was going fishing that day. And when he heard on the radio that there was a hijack and, and that the guy may have landed in his neighborhood, he, he may have thought, well, I may have just aided and abetted a criminal and he paid me this money. I'm going to get rid of it right now. And he may have buried it in the sand and walked away. Now, that is 100% speculation on my part. There's absolutely no evidence that that happened. But I think we, if we ever do get the final story on the money, it's going to be some weird thing like that. I, I tend to agree with that. It's going to be something weird. Now that we've solved the uh, the Tina Bar money find, let's talk about something else that no one can agree on, the flight path. Oh, the flight path. Is the FBI's flight path accurate? That's a question that's been a hot topic as of this year. Everybody was not so concerned about it years ago. Now everybody's concerned about it. Uh, we have no reason to believe that the flight path that the FBI provided on the map is wrong. The information in the uh, 302s corroborates the locations on the flight path. So in the 302s, there's text about the flight path went over this, went over that, X, Y. We did a study on the SAGE radar that was used at the time. Now, most people weren't alive back then these days that may be listening to this uh, broadcast. But back back in the 60s, there was a big threat from Russia. And they were afraid that they were going to send Soviet bombers across the Pacific Ocean and bomb us on the West Coast. So they developed what was called the SAGE radar, which at the time was the largest computer system anywhere in the world. And the computer that ran this radar was three stories tall. And the purpose of the computer was to integrate data from multiple radar stations along the coast into one display that the operators could see. So it was kind of a solid shield all up and down the west coast. So what we did was we recreated Cooper's flight path according to the FBI map in Google Earth. And in Google Earth, you can do that and you can put the flight at 10,000 feet and you can see the line in the sky, basically, where the plane flew. So the next thing we did was we went and historically located all of the SAGE radars that were along, that, along the flight path. And what we found was there were like a half a dozen radar dishes between Seattle and Portland. And then we uh, put a spot on Google Earth and we went and stood on the ground virtually on Google Earth and looked up in the sky, as Google Earth will let you do. And we said, can we see this flight path from here? And the answer was yes. So there was no time at all that the radar dishes could not see Cooper's plane. So what we have here now is the most sophisticated radar ever developed with multiple radar dishes capable of looking out thousands of miles across across the Pacific Ocean at small targets, plane sized targets, and determine where they are accurately enough that they could send fighters to intercept those bombers, potentially coming from Russia. Uh, and they're basically now looking in their own backyard at a plane flying at 10,000 feet, literally, you know, 100 or 200 miles away, if that. And uh, it should have been a cakewalk for the SAGE radar to track the Cooper plane. So the idea that they would have screwed something up and, and not, uh, not been able to follow that plane, even through light rain, uh, makes no sense to us. So there's no reason to believe that the flight path is incorrect? No, none whatsoever. Now, there's a couple of errors on the flight path. Why do you think there's so much debate? Uh, well, because a lot of people have theories, and if your theory needs the flight path to be over here, right, well, then you're, then the flight path's got to be wrong, right? Because my theory's right, your flight path's got to be wrong. So the, there's one guy that claims uh, he knew D.B. Cooper, and he landed 
and got and got went into the bar and got a drink and had called up somebody. And that guy, for that guy to be DB Cooper, the flight path needs to be way further east. So him and Jerry Thomas would would feel good about that idea. Uh, and then there's another guy that's now saying that the flight path went over Tina Bar, and Cooper jumped out just a little bit north of Tina Bar, and then was walking down the road. And when he hit civilization, he decided to go bury the money on Tina Bar. So in that case, the flight path has to be right up to a certain point, but then be wrong after that point. So, uh, you know, that's, an, again, a case of, you know, you need the flight path to match the description of your theory. So that's what's causing a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, angst in the Cooper vortex right now. There are a couple of interesting things about the flight path, though. They, when Cooper let the stairs down, one of the placards on the stairs blew out the back of the plane and miraculously was recovered years later by a couple of hunters. So the location of that placard uh, was never made public, and we ended up talking to the family, and they went back out to this area, which was turned out to be a hunting ground that they go to regularly for, their, for decades. And uh, they gave us a GPS location for where they found the placard. And it turned out to be right underneath the, the flight path. So offhand, you'd think that that's a great anchor. Well, it is in one respect, but other people want to argue that it should not have been right under the flight path. It should have been back to the east a distance because the placard would have drifted uh, coming down from 10,000 feet and there were southwest winds. So they said it should have drifted out to the east of the flight path. Uh, and it's actually slightly to the west of the flight path, which goes against the winds that were going on that night. So uh, one of the latest informations to come to light is that in discussing the, the drop of this placard, uh, uh, my group was able to recover the winds aloft information. This is just as of about a week ago uh, that showed what the winds were at various altitudes. So we didn't have that information before. Now we can actually do a correct drift analysis on the placard. But the, uh, the other thing that's confounding that analysis right now is that it was also raining at the time. So rain would have an opportunity to push the fairly lightweight placard uh, to the ground faster than you would think it would just drift without rain. So these are the kinds of things that you get involved with in the Cooper story when you start looking in the details and you try and nail down what's fact from fiction. And this is information you got last week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're still actively working on the case? Well, you know, what happens is there's, there's big discussions about these things. And because I did the analysis on the flight path, and determine that there's no reason that, to believe that the flight path is inaccurate. You know, uh, I'm the target, or my research is the target of the people who want to make the, the flight path not accurate. So, I mean, you can sit down and argue about things like how far the placard drift all you want, but uh, I was actually talking to a friend of mine not involved in the Cooper case, and he said, what's new in the Cooper world? I said, well, we're arguing about the flight path. He said, what's the problem? He said, we're wondering how far this placard drifted. And he said, well, why don't you just go get the uh, winds aloft data from that night on 1971? I go, I have no idea how to do that. He goes, well, I know how to do that. So he was an atmospheric scientist at Jet Pulsion Laboratory for decades. And uh, it actually took him a little bit of effort to go get it. It was, it was kind of cryptic to go get it. But he was the one that actually provided me with the information. And then uh, I put it up on the forum. And it's under analysis right now. So that's actually the latest, hottest breaking news in the Cooper vortex. If we can use that information to determine uh, the flight path where the placard landed and how it drifted to get there, can we use that same information to determine where Cooper landed? Well, the the placard landed further north of where, where Cooper jumped. Right. The and placard was outside Tootle, I believe, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it was further north. So uh, it, what it says is the placard will make a determination that the flight path was accurate up to that point. But there's nothing that can prove where it was south of the placard. And that's the point of debate right now. Some people would like it to go over uh, over the Columbia River. Other people want it to be where it is. Other people want it to be further east. So at the moment, we, we can anchor it as far as the placard. So if the flight path's accurate, do you believe the drop zone's accurate? 
that's another thing that is has been contested over the years uh there one of the errors that's on the flight path map is there's a timing error uh there's marks on the map and then there's there's uh, timing for those marks and there's one or two errors in those marks so uh, the the analysis was if if you know they had that wrong could the jump area be wrong uh, it's possible that the jump area could be wrong but again we don't see any information that would lead us to believe that it's not what so one of the things that they talk about is the jump time because that jet's moving pretty fast at 200 miles an hour the time of the jump is important if you assume that the flight path is correct then the next variable is that when did he jump well we happen to know when he jumped because the pilot was on the radio at, at the moment cooper jumped and when cooper jumped off the stairs the stairs rebounded and created a weird pressure spike in the cabin that everybody felt and they said oh something happened he may have just jumped so he was on the radio when it happened and went oh you know he may have just jumped because they, they felt this pressure spike thing so multiple people were listening in including members of the public that were monitoring the situation and when he said that everybody wrote down the time and that's one of the things that we saw in the fbi archive is we saw the timing that they the fbi collected information from ham radio operators from the from the you know the guys in the towers and they had a list of four or five or six different people that had all noted the time uh, when the pilot said cooper jumped and they were all within about a minute which was actually pretty good uh, because back then you know we didn't have the kind of watches and stuff we have today so uh it was all within about a couple of minutes around uh, a little bit after 10, 10 minutes or so after eight is when the jump was. So according to all of our simulations and everything we look at, uh, that puts him right in the aerial area. So the, you believe the drop zone is pretty accurate? Yes. Yes. Do you believe he survived the jump? That was an open question for a long time, but that is a, that's a question I think we can answer today better than they could have answered back then. The original story was that he didn't survive the jump. Uh, some of that was convenience on the FBI's part because then they couldn't catch him. You know, they, they never caught him, then he died. Right. So 40 some plus more than 40 years later now, we have the, the history behind us. The area that he jumped out in was not the deep, dark death woods like, you know, everybody made out back in the 70s. It was, it was actually populated, and if you've randomly dropped yourself into any area there, if you walked a mile, you'd probably hit a road. So uh, had he died and augured in, he, he, the only way he could have died is there'd be a no pull, right? So he could have never pulled his parachute and, and went straight in. For him to go in there and now survive, you know, stay hidden for the past 40 years as a dead body, uh, it would be amazing. I mean, the odds against that are so phenomenal. And they put a thousand National Guard in the, the area weeks after the event. They found other dead bodies, but not Cooper. They found an so, eight inch placard. Uh, yeah, well, that was, that was, they, those guys didn't do it, but some hunter guys did. So they had a lot of people looking in that neighborhood for a long time and no evidence of Cooper ever, ever showed up. Now, what do I think happened? I think that he, he, he hit the woods somewhere in the middle of the night, probably waited till dawn, uh, packed up all his stuff, including the parachute, walked until he got close to a road. He probably then stashed the parachute, stashed the money, stashed all of his stuff just not very far from a road, walked out to the road wearing a suit and a tie and not carrying anything else with him, hitchhike his way out saying my car broke down i need a ride and so and so once he got his car he could have come back and picked up the parachute and the money and made a clean getaway of it now you have to remember from cooper's perspective cooper didn't know that they knew when he jumped the whole purpose of the way cooper set up this hijacking was he was going to lower the air stairs and anywhere between seattle and in mexico city was where he wanted to go originally they wouldn't have known where along that flight path he jumped. He had no premonition that the, the movement of the air stair would cause the signal to the pilot. 
So he thought he had all the time in the world to do whatever he wanted to do because nobody knows where he is. So he could have easily come back, grabbed the parachute, grabbed the money, knowing that by cleaning up after himself here, there would never be any evidence to link him to the crime. So I think that's probably what happened. He survived and cleaned up after himself. Have you read any of Marty Andrade's work? I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. But uh, he did a probability no. on him surviving the jump, comparing World War II ejections uh, under you know terrible circumstances, dudes who maybe have only had one practice jump or zero. Um, and it was very, very high survivability rate. I mean, people whose planes had been shot down and they're bailing out at the last minute. Um, and you, Cooper had a little bit better circumstances than that. Yeah. So I think, uh, like I said, I think the idea that Cooper died in the jump was mostly promoted by the FBI because they had a lot of egg on their face at that moment. This is definitely speculation, but do you think that Cooper had planned where he was going to jump? Uh, no, because he, he specified a lot of things. He specified the altitude, he specified the speed, he specified the wheels down, he specified the, the flaps, right? The, he specified the parachutes. The one thing he didn't specify was where you're going to fly the plane. Now, this is a pretty dangerous thing because he was in fairly cloudy weather. It would be hard for him to know whether he was over the ground or over the ocean in this cloudy weather. So uh, the pilots had speculated at one point about just flying over the ocean, letting him jump into the ocean. So that seems to be a big weak link in his planning for uh, this caper. So how he assumed that he would jump out somewhere safe is a, uh, is a bit of a mystery, especially in the conditions he was in. He was also kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because he originally intended to jump during daytime. You know, things got delayed, and that's why he ended up jumping at night. So his original plan was to jump during the day, and then he probably could have had a better chance to see where he was at. Uh, but it didn't work out that way for him. So things did go against him in the way things unfolded. Yeah, definitely. I can't imagine jumping out of a plane at night into the woods. That would be wild. Well, if going to jail was your other option, <laughs> you may think differently. I've heard people speculate that he never jumped out of the plane and was just hiding in some compartment uh, when the plane landed. That's all, all, all the Cooper amateurs suspect that. I get emails about that all the time, right? Oh, yeah, he probably hid in the plane under a seat or in the bathroom or something. The FBI is way smarter than that, right? you got to give the FBI some credit. So the FBI was watching the plane with binoculars from the minute it was within sight of the airport. And they were watching specifically to see if he was going to jump out either before the plane landed or while the plane was taxiing down the runway to try and make a getaway for it. So they were, they were on him right at the get-go at the landing. So there was no way that he was going to get off that plane without them seeing him. The minute they got on the plane, once they realized the bomb was not there, uh, they searched the whole plane. They looked for him on that plane. Because they had the idea way before everybody else did that maybe he's hiding on the plane somewhere. So he was not hiding anywhere on that plane. He actually did jump. And that's also evidenced by the fact that that pressure bump showed that he left the stairway. And the reason why we know that is because they took the same plane up about a week later. Uh, they put 150 or 200 pound weight on the end of the stairs. They went out over the ocean. And when they dumped the weight off the stairs the same way that Cooper jumped off the stairs, they felt the same pressure bump in the cockpit that they felt the time before when Cooper hijacked the plane. So these things all tie together very nicely to show that Cooper did jump off the plane and that uh, things actually went down the way we prescribed. Yeah, I think that's great evidence that the drop zone's accurate. I mean, assuming the flight path's accurate as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again... You know, the guys were working on this thing. They were really motivated to find him. They weren't doing a sloppy job. They had limited resources then compared to it now. But, you know, like I say, they also had a lot of confidence they would see Russian bombers coming in over the horizon. So they, they were, they knew what they were doing. They had done, this wasn't their first rodeo. So the plane lands on the ground. What evidence is there of D.B. Cooper left on the plane? 
So Cooper was uh, very aware of fingerprints and things like that. Of course, there was no DNA at that time. So he had smoked a bunch of cigarettes, and uh, they recovered some of the cigarettes. They recovered the tie that he had left on his seat in the plane, strangely enough, which we think was a big mistake on his part because he was grabbing all the notes and everything that he had written to the flight attendants. So he was very careful about all that. Uh, the fact that he left the tie on the plane was uh, really a big, big mistake on his part. Uh, they, I can't remember if they recovered anything else. They found a hair on his seat, uh, which they, they, they had in storage somewhere. Uh, the problem with most of the evidence that was uh, uh, collected, they also collected some fingerprints, but they were not very conclusive. And there was a lot of fingerprints on the plane. So the problem with the cigarette butts and the hair is that they've been lost to history. So nobody knows where the cigarette butts are now. Everybody liked to find them because the DNA there could tell us something. Uh, and the hair is likewise gone. Uh, there was no reports of the hair being analyzed or anything after the fact. Uh, I think a lot of it was that they probably couldn't do much with the hair back at that time. Uh, cigarette butts, same thing. They were Raleigh cigarettes that he was smoking. So they knew that. So uh, that was the kind of stuff that was left on the plane. The tie is the one interesting thing that survives from uh, what they found on the plane. And you've done a lot of work with the tie, haven't you? Yeah, the tie I find to be the most singularly interesting piece of the Cooper puzzle. Well, it's really the only real piece of evidence. It's the only piece that we have of him. All the evidence and discussion about the Cooper case starts with the hijacking and moves forward from there. The tie is the only thing that points backwards in time and talks to be, talks speaks to the fact of who Cooper was and where he had been. And where he had been can tell us a lot about who Cooper is. And you first had access to the tie in March of 2009. Is that correct? Yeah, our first uh, trip uh, to the FBI archives, we knew the tie was there. Uh, it was something we were very interested in. We had a lot of information to look through and go through, so it was not our only focus. But r realizing, and everybody should take note of this, of all the pieces of clothing you could leave on a plane, you left a tie on the plane, and the tie is the only piece of clothing that you never wash. And because you never wash the tie, it accumulates particles from everywhere you've been for the whole time you've been wearing it. That's a big deal. So knowing this, we went there with the idea that we would take sticky samples from the tie and try and find things on the tie that would point to where Cooper had been. So one of the things we were particularly interested in was looking for pollen on the tie. Because at this point in the game, when we went to the FBI archive, Cooper could have been anybody in the entire country. I mean, that's how big the search window was. We had nothing narrowing that, that search down at all, except, you know, he was a white guy and he was about five foot 10 and he didn't have an accent. So very few things were narrowing the, the search down. It could have been anybody. So we went and we took the sticky samples and we were looking for pollen. Well, turns out we found pollen, which was pretty darn exciting. We found two species of pollen on the tie. So we said, okay, now the story that I'm going to relate to you is one of the biggest runarounds we've had in the Cooper, in the Cooper vortex. And this is why once you get sucked in, <laughs> it, it can chew you up and spit you out. <laughs> so we took a picture under the electron microscope of the one of the more interesting pollen grains, and we sent it to a pollen expert. And he said, well, this looks most closely related to the impatience flower. So we said, great. All right, impatience flower. Now, impatience are the kinds of things you tend to grow in your garden. So... The first thing we did was we went out and we bought a bunch of impatience plants at the local gardening store and we extracted the pollen from it and we put it under the microscope and none of those pollen types, none of the, those plant types available in your garden store matched the pollen that was on Cooper's tie. 
So we said, okay, it's not one of those, not an easy one. So then we did some research into impatience and we found out that there's thousands of species of impatience around the world, but they're geographically very limited. So if you get species A, it may only grow in the mountains around San Francisco and species B may only grow in the northern part of Wisconsin. So we knew that if we could identify this particular pollen grain, we may be able to really zone in on to where he was. So we then in contacted uh, the world's foremost expert on impatience in Europe, and we sent him pictures of the pollen grain, and he did a big study and found out that the closest match was from Eastern Central Africa in the country of Gabon. So we said, wow, that is really crazy. So we started looking into Gabon. Why would Gabon have anything going on? At this point, we'd also found some interesting metals on the tie, which included titanium. And it turns out Gabon had a uranium mines going on out there, and they had some exotic metal mining happening out there. So uh, we looked into that for a while and tried to figure out, you know, who was going back and forth to Gabon. Back then, it was a pretty dangerous place to go. So our, at that point, our Cooper profile looked like it was a pretty exotic world traveler. Then looking into uh, getting more pictures of the pollen from other pollen grains on the tie, we found a particular angle on one of the pollen grains that showed the slit in the side of the pollen grain. So pollens have, pollen grains have like a weak, a weak line in them where they split open when they pollinate. Well, this was not a single line. There were three lines on this particular pollen grain that we've been examining for months at this point. And the three lines hit me like a ton of bricks because I knew right away it was not a pollen grain. It was actually a spore. So spores have what they have, what they call a trilete opening, which has these three lines that split open. And I knew at that point that we had been barking up the wrong tree for a long time. So in looking into the spores, we immediately identified it as coming from a lycopodium, uh, lycopodium uh, spores. And it is a um, fairly common plant. So we said, okay, you know, what was this plant used for? Well, as it turns out, the pollen from the lycopodium plant is used in pills to keep them from sticking together in the 70s. It's also used in a few other things, but that was the most common usage at the time. So our, our, our chase of the pollen grain led all the way around the world, came all the way back home, and ended up in an aspirin bottle. So one thing we can probably say about Cooper from the pollen chase is that he, he was probably a pill popper. <laughs> and that's about as far as it goes. So that one was a real, uh, real bit of a disappointment. So tracking the pollen down led to the fact that he takes aspirin or yeah. some other pill. Yeah, quite the letdown, yes. But the point that you, you want to understand there is that in scientific investigations, you have to go down all the dead ends. You know, every time we, we, we would research something and come up with a dead end and I would tell somebody about it, they say, oh, it's too bad. You're going to quit now, aren't you? I go, well, no. You know, I said, if you're trying to catch a murderer and you have 20 suspects, you're going to have 19 dead ends before you catch the guy. I said, so just because you look at the first guy and he's not the murderer, you don't quit. So as a scientist, you have to go down all these dead ends to ensure that they are actually dead. Now, that one took a little longer than it should have, but uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. So after that dead end, where'd you go to next with the tie? So the next most interesting thing that we had on the tie was we found a piece of titanium metal on the tie. So titanium is a fairly common thing today, but in 1971, it was very uncommon. It was not used in golf clubs or consumer products. It was very hard to make. It was very expensive. It was used primarily in military. It was just being started to being used in commercial aircraft. And it was being adapted into the chemical industry because it would, it would not uh, corrode away. It had very high corrosion resistance. 
So we found a thing that looked like a bar. And now this is microscopic. This is the size of a blood cell. Um, but it was not a tangled mess. It was obviously something that had scraped off of a piece of metal. And uh, we analyzed it. We can analyze very small particles under the electron microscope and tell you what the elemental composition is. And it turned out to be pure titanium. So we knew at the point that we found the titanium, because of its rarity, that this put Cooper into a very small corner of the world. So just with that single find, we knew that he went from being anybody in the country to somebody that would wear a tie into a place that used titanium. So he went from millions of people down to thousands of people. Well, we kept looking around. We found a second piece of titanium. And once we analyzed it, we found out that in the corner of this piece of titanium, there was a piece of stainless steel that was smashed into it. Now, the stainless steel turned out to be a high corrosion resistant stainless steel. And again, the titanium was pure titanium. So uh, when this information became public in the Cooper Vortex, everybody jumped to the, to the conclusion that well, this guy must have worked at Boeing because at the time in 1971, Boeing was working on the supersonic transport, the SST. And this was a very advanced commercial plane that was going to fly across the Atlantic Ocean in a couple of hours from Europe to the United States at a faster than the speed of sound. So the characteristic of this plane was that it was made all from titanium. So it seemed like a great match. Add to that, the fact that the SST project was canceled in mid-1971 and a bunch of people were laid off. So uh, it looked like a perfect match. But the problem was, once we looked into it, was that the titanium that is used in aircraft is alloyed. It's never used as pure titanium because pure titanium by itself is too soft. If this pieces that we found were alloyed, we would have been able to detect it right away. So... Our conclusion was that he did not work at Boeing, but the idea that he did lives on. I guess certain memes just never die. <laughs> so the, the titanium uh, was fascinating, and we looked into the entire titanium process. So we said, okay, at the end of the line is Boeing using alloy titanium. Let's go up the line and understand everything that happens with titanium and try and find out where in the titanium pipeline would Cooper have been. So to produce titanium, the first thing you start out with is these black sands that are very high in titanium. Uh, we didn't see anything like black sand on his tie. So we knew he was not part of the mining operation for of these black sands. So the black sands then go to a primary titanium manufacturing facility where they take the sand and they, at the time, they would put it into a big pressure vessel and they would actually weld the top closed. They would put chlorine in there with the sand and they would heat it up under high heat and pressure and the chlorine would attach itself to the titanium in the sand and when you drain the chlorine out, it would bring the titanium with it. And now you'd have titanium chloride. The titanium chloride, known as tickle in the industry, would then go to another process where they would introduce magnesium into the, the chlorine titanium mix. The magnesium would attach itself to the chlorine. And now you'd have magnesium chloride and pure titanium. So what they would do is they'd wash away the magnesium chloride and what you'd have left is pure titanium sponge, they called it. So it was kind of like a, uh, looked like actually like a physical sponge, like in your kitchen, but it was made of titanium. So looking at the particles on the tie, what we found was there was a lot of chlorine on the tie, which really pointed to this manufacturing uh, type of facility. The problem was there was no magnesium on the tie. There was only one particle of magnesium. But there was a lot of salt on the tie, which at the time we thought he liked French fries. 
So we kept looking into the titanium manufacturing process. And what we found out was that back in 1971, there was one company called RMI in Ashtabula, Ohio, that made very high quality titanium. And they used a different process. They used a process called the Hunter process. The first part was the same where they locked the, the sand in a chamber with chlorine. The second part was different. When they extracted the chlorine and titanium mix, and they put it in another vessel, they added sodium instead of magnesium and the sodium combined with the chlorine to make sodium chloride, or you know it as table salt. So this is a more expensive method, but it produced higher quality titanium. But now if Cooper was in that world, you'd expect that you'd find on the tie titanium, chlorine, and salt. <laughs> so we said, wow, this is uh, one of the hottest connections we've seen here. But the question remained, is the salt from the French fries? We don't know. So we did another analytical project. We went to the store and we bought all the salts we could find at the store. Sea salt, regular salt, all kinds of salt. We then analyzed each of the store-bought salt and we compared it to the stuff from Cooper's tie and none of it matched. We then were able to get a sample of RMI titanium from the time period from a, a guy who studied titanium. And we studied the salt on the, on the RMI samples from the 70s, and it was a match. Oh, really? So everything pointed to RMI, yeah, as one of the potential sources for Cooper. So because he wore a tie, we would expect him to be a manager in the plant that was working on this uh, titanium. So we brought our evidence to the FBI. At the time, Larry Carr had left, which was a big blow to the, to the case and our ability to work inside the case with the FBI. Uh, the new FBI agent there, Curtis Eng, did listen attentively to our story. He thought that it had some merit. He ended up calling up RMI and asking them if they had anybody that worked there in the 70s that you know was potentially Canadian or quit or anything like that. And RMI's answer was a quick and short no. So RMI has had a lot of problems with the public due to some uranium spills in one of the factories that they had in Ohio. So they're very gun shy about talking to the public. Interesting. So RMI was very gun shy about talking to the public. So the FBI left it at that. Uh, there is actually a 302 report about questioning RMI somewhere in the FBI archive at this point. But that uh, was where it ended. We still think that RMI is an interesting possibility, although as a private citizen, we have no way to investigate things. So that's one of the things that, that we ran into in, in trying to investigate a case is that we can investigate evidence with laboratory equipment, but we can't investigate people, right? Only the FBI has the ability to investigate people. So, you know, if we do come up with somebody, uh, you know, they could just as easily remain anonymous and never get investigated. And then the the tie was investigated again in 2016, is that right? Yes, fairly recently here in the last few years. Uh, I've been on TV quite a bit for the Cooper case. So Expedition Unknown approached me and they said, we'd like to have you on and, and do something with the Cooper case. I said, that's great. Well, then they asked the question that nobody else asked, which turns out to be a really important question if you're smart. They said, well, if you could investigate uh, anything you want, you know, what would you do? If you had some money and you could spend it, what would you do? And I said, wow, I said, that's a great question. I said, I would take our particle stubs. We have these little things called stubs or little aluminum platforms with sticky tape on them. We push them onto the tie and we peel them off. And the stub is what goes in the electron microscope. I said, I would take our stubs to the McCrone Associates out of Chicago, who is an internationally renowned, world famous analytical laboratory. They do all types of analysis of all types of things. They did the Shroud of Turin. Uh, they, anytime there's an argument, these are the guys you go to. And I knew that when we went to these guys, they have this particular type of machine 
that can search for and analyze particles automatically on our stubs. Now all the particles that we analyzed, we had to manually look around and search for them and find them and do the analysis. So we ended up doing about 700 particles. But this machine that they had can do thousands of particles per hour. So uh, I said, these are the guys. So they talked to the Macron Associates, and they were excited about it, and they did it for free. <laughs> nice. Wish I'd known that. I would have yeah. known them a long time ago. I'm sure being on TV had something to do with it. Uh, so they analyzed the stubs for us on this automated equipment, and they came up with 100,000 particle analysis. So the database got absolutely huge. Uh, and that was a big deal. Now, what came of that? When you have 100,000 particles to look at, you've got a new problem now. Now you're swamped with data. So we looked at this uh, giant database, this 100,000 particle database now, and we, we combed through it. And what we did is we pulled out uh, some of the most interesting things. Now, the, the most unusual crazy thing that we found was we found examples of rare earth elements. Now, rare earth elements are not that rare, but they don't come packed in a vein like gold or other things. You can't go find a zone where they're concentrated geologically. They're spread out kind of very evenly over the earth. So the odds of, of getting something like a rare earth element on your tie naturally are virtually zero. The other thing about these rare earth elements is they were used in very particular applications. So there was yttrium, which is actually found in lighter flints, so we had to discount that one. There was strontium, and there was, and I can't think of the last one offhand, I have to look it up. But the, the, the other two rare earth elements that we found are phosphors. They're typically used as phosphors on cathode ray tubes, which are CRTs, cathode ray tubes. And those were the TV tubes of the time. So TV tubes are coated with these phosphors on the inside of the tube. And when the electron beam hits them, they glow. And that's how you get uh, color in your TV. So looking at that, the phosphors, we now even had a, a narrower range to look at. Because we know that he was involved with titanium. And now we know that he was involved with phosphors. So phosphors meant, let's say, the TV world. All right, again, the TV production industry was the largest user of phosphors at the time. So you'd say, okay, probably worked in TV manufacturing. But the problem was that we found almost no steel on the tie, but we found a ton of stainless steel. Finding stainless steel on the tie tells you that he was not in the regular TV industry because TVs would use regular steel. Stainless steel is an expensive way to go. So it narrowed him down even further to say he was involved in some type of uh, most likely cathode ray tube production at the high end that used a lot of stainless steel. So this is an interesting further reduction in the area that we can look to find Cooper. So again, we, we took this information and we, we took a step back and we said, okay, who makes high-end cathode ray tubes in 1971? Well, it turns out that one of the biggest manufacturers of these devices was Tektronix. They manufactured oscilloscopes, which are high-end instruments for measuring electricity. And they manufactured their own cathode ray tubes. Now, the really interesting point about identifying Tektronix is you ask, well, where was their factory located? Well, it was located right outside of Portland, where this whole thing started. Very interesting. Yes, very, very interesting. So, uh, there's another connection, actually, that potentially comes back to Boeing, believe it or not. So, I've told you that, that Boeing has no connection, but as the vortex is known to do, it will suck people in and spit out new information. So, when we were on the Expedition Unknown shoot the guys behind the camera became fascinated with the Cooper story. And one guy went absolutely wild and every break he was Googling stuff about Cooper. So one of the things that this guy found out was that the supersonic transport was gonna be the first uh, plane to have a cathode ray tube on it 
for radar. <laughs> it was going to have its first display in the SST project. So there is an interesting possibility that Cooper, uh, that Boeing may have said, hey, uh, yeah, let's try and get a radar screen on this thing. Yeah, where can we buy a radar screen? Oh, yeah, Tiktronics outside of town there. Maybe they can cook one up for us. So it would be a real interesting uh, addition to the story to think, and this is speculation at this point, that maybe Cooper was the liaison that went between Boeing and Tektronics in getting a CRT to fly on the SST project. And the housing for that for that cathode ray tube would have almost certainly been made out of titanium to match everything else in the cockpit. So Tektronics is a current point of focus uh, for us right now. And we've got a, another production company interested in doing uh, some filming on Cooper, and they are interested in uh, taking apart an oscilloscope from that time period <clears throat> and examining the metals and the phosphors that were in that thing and see if it matches what's on the tie. So we may have some new information coming up. Was RMI, were they doing anything like that at the time? Not that we could tell. You know, RMI was just making bulk titanium. Uh, they were supplying stuff to Boeing. So, uh, you know, we have two interesting possibilities here with RMI on the titanium end, but then probably the stronger connection at this point in the game looks like Tektronix. Now, Tektronix is an, a much more interesting company than RMI because they have such a long history. There's actually a museum for Tektronix that's independent of the company, and they also have employee uh, picture books from the 70s or from the 71 time period. Uh, so we may actually be able to go look through the employee picture books and see if we can find him if he's there where's this museum at is there a physical it's, location? yeah it's a physical museum it's in portland oh wow yeah i gotta go check that out yeah there's your ne there's your next blog stop <laughs> what about the theory that the tide was just purchased i mean if i was going to hijack a plane tomorrow i probably wouldn't wear what i wear to work well you probably wouldn't wear a suit and tie either well yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> right. Probably wouldn't wear a suit and tie either. So, yes. So, uh, everybody that's got a theory and his guy does not wear a tie naturally, every every suspect that does not wear a tie naturally, the excuse is Cooper bought the tie at a 5 and 10 store. Well, if you're not used to wearing a tie, what would make you think to go dress up in a suit and jump out of a plane? Would that really be your first thought to That's do a good that? Point. You know, now, if you wore a suit and tie every day, then maybe it would feel natural to go on a plane and then uh, jump out at the end of the day. You know, the other thing is that the tie was a very cheap tie. So the tie was not, it had no value to start with. It was about two bucks or something back in the day. So why a a used clothing store would buy a crappy used tie for resale at at literally pennies uh, would not make sense. You know, if used clothing stores want high-end clothing that's desirable and you can still sell for something and make a buck, they don't take t-shirts and things like that and try and resell. So could it have possibly been? Yes. You know, but as an investigator investigating something this old you have to take it at face value you know so what we say is face value you know the flight plan is is the flight path is correct so we see no evidence to point another direction face value he was wearing a suit uh, he smoked cigarettes there was a lot of cigarette particles on the tie uh, why would you wear a suit unless it was very comfortable for you to do so so you can argue that he bought the tie but you're you're it's not the the default position. So you believe that he owned the tie. It was his tie. We think that given the current evidence, that's the most plausible explanation. You know, if Cooper's a manager or an engineer at one of these facilities that's on the edge of technology for 1971, I mean, it should be a high paying position, most likely an educated guy. It doesn't seem to be like the kind of guy who would commit a crime that could land him in jail for the rest of his life. Unless you had a problem that you had to solve. So good people are pushed 
to do extreme things under extreme situations. Now, this, this guy, he's a nice guy. I mean, the original FBI description was he was a hardened, horrible criminal. But, you know, he had food brought on board for the pilots, knowing they were going to be in the air for a long time. He offered cash to the flight attendants as kind of a tip, and they turned it down. Right? They say, no, we can't take tips. And the flight attendants were chided afterwards for not taking the money because they said, well, you could have recovered some of the money. Right? So Cooper was by no means acting in any way that said hardened criminal. If anything, he was acting as a sorry to bother you. Here's some food and here's some money. You know, uh, you know, hope you feel better after this is all over with. <laughs> yeah, that's a good so point. He that even, doesn't point to a guy, right? Yeah, it doesn't he, point to a hardened criminal that's trying to get away with something. <laughs> no, he even so, paid for his drinks. Yeah. The other thing is, now they've got enough of these hijackings, they found out that typically, after a guy does a hijacking, he goes back to his hometown. <laughs> right? They usually catch him in his, their hometowns. Now, ask yourself this question. When did he do the jump? He did the jump the day before Thanksgiving, right? So that would give him a long weekend to get out of the woods and back home without without missing a day of work. Definitely. Yeah, I've also heard people talk about the, the best people as far as the FBI are on vacation. So you have not the top tier air traffic controllers. You don't have the top tier FBI guys because they're with their families for Thanksgiving. Well... I don't, I don't think he thought he was going to get caught at that point, but, you know, he uh, he thought he had a pretty good plan. I don't know if it included wh- who's working that day at the FBI, but, uh, you know, you can see that he would be the type of guy that if the mafia came and said to you, I'm going to put a bullet in your head unless you pay me 200 grand, that's the kind of thing that motivates the average guy to go hijack a plane, jump out with the money, pay the money off and say, I'm never going to get in trouble like that again, go back to his normal life and then never commit another crime and never get caught again. Uh, I think that's a real possibility for Cooper, is that he was a he was kind of a normal guy that got caught in an abnormal situation and did a desperate thing that he happened to get away with, and then uh, never was, you know, kept his head low and went back to his normal life. Again, speculation, but, you know, the, he, 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 I th- he think he would have been caught. If he, was a, if he was a criminal, he would have been caught down the road. There's uh there's two dozen suspects that are somewhat legitimate. Are any of those suspects that you're interested in? No. So, you know, I made I think I made a pretty clear case here how the particles on the tie show that Cooper is involved in some kind of management or uh, you know, engineering area somewhere in the high tech world, especially pertaining to titanium or something with rare earth elements in it. And if you look at the, the crop of current crop of suspects or the past crop of suspects, none of them fit into that category. And uh, I should say that we don't have any suspects. We don't, we don't push sub, uh, suspects. We analyze evidence. So we come up with the evidence. Our evidence creates a profile. Uh, your suspect, as far as we're concerned, has to match our profile. And we don't see that happening with any of the current suspects. Do you think this case will ever be solved? Yes, I do. I actually have good reason to believe that there is a better chance of surviving, of solving the case now than in the past. And the reason for that is Cooper didn't do this in a complete vacuum. Somebody knows something out there about the Cooper case. And as long as Cooper was alive, uh, you wouldn't have uh, those people coming forward. So we have to wait to the point where Cooper dies and then somebody will say, well, okay, now I can come forward and say something. Now, we had an interesting discussion with the FBI uh, in, a, in a moment of honesty. They told us that even if you catch Cooper, you know, we're not going to convict them. They said, because we don't waste our time convicting people, spending money on convicting people they are going to die in court because Cooper would be well into his 80s at this point. Oh, at least. So uh, I said, well, if you're not going to convict them, I said, then why don't you put out a thing saying we'll give immunity to anybody that comes forward with Cooper information, <laughs> right? And and the FBI agent you know, I was talking to, we thought that was a great idea. <laughs> he goes, yeah, you know, we should probably do that, right? It only makes sense. Like, you want to get it over and done with, let's let's see if there's anybody out there that's got anything. And uh, I even volunteered to say, I'll investigate the guys if they come forward. You don't even have to do it. 
and he went and talked to his boss and his boss nixed it. So, I mean, that's the way to shake the, the Cooper tree and get something to fall out is let's go ahead and say, okay, come forward with info. We won't uh, convict you. We promise. But uh, somehow that's, uh, that's not forthcoming at this point. So I think that there's information out there that will come to light and, uh, you know, could potentially do it. We, we had one interesting email from some anonymous guy that said, my grandfather was D.B. Cooper and he had a, a box of things in the attic that he had kept from the, from the stuff. And uh, I said, what's in the attic? He goes, well, there's some parachute cord and there's some other stuff and this, this, and this. And now there's a lot of crazies out there. So I said, you know, well, can you measure how long the parachute cord is? And uh, he came back and he said, well, it was 20 feet. Well, that, that's not how long the parachute cord was. So uh, that was, that turned into a, a dead end and he never contacted me again. So it was, again, it could have been one of the Cooper, Cooper wannabes. But I suspect that at some point in the game, and I'm waiting for that day to happen, somebody will call me up and say, hey, you know, my father who used to work at uh, this place and was involved in TV tube stuff and this, this, and this, and he left this, this, and this here and there and uh, blah, blah, blah. And I think we'll get a breakthrough in the case. You know, uh, that may be, you know, wishful thinking on my part since I've been working on this thing for quite a while. But uh, I think it's a reasonable thing to believe that information is out there that will come to light after Cooper's for sure gone. So next few years, keep your fingers crossed. Yeah, it's, o it's only been 49 years so far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you'd be about 89 now, right? So so he's, once he gets to 100, he's most likely not here. Then we'll start giving up hope. What do you think could be done with the evidence we have that could narrow it down any further? Is there anything that hasn't been done yet? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, one of the things that we would like to investigate that we cannot get a handle on is the aerial parachute. So this parachute was found up an aerial Washington by some kids not too long ago. I think it was 2000. Wanted to say it was in the single digit 2000s, fairly fairly recently. And uh, they brought it home, and the parents recognized this could be DB Cooper's shoot. Uh, they brought it to the FBI. The FBI uh, called this guy Cozy, who was the one that packed the parachute. He walked in, took one look at the parachute, and said, that one's not mine. Uh, it's a silk parachute it's from another era. And that was it. So the FBI then dismissed it. They still have the parachute. We didn't see it, actually. It's somewhere else. Um, the Cooper Vortex then took a look at it. And one of the guys in the vortex said, you know, if that was a silk parachute being buried underground for a long time, it wouldn't be in the shape that it's in. Then they looked up the, the printed number on the thing and they found out that it was manufactured during World War II. And during World War II, there was no silk parachutes being manufactured because the place that silk came from was Japan. And we were, you know, bombing the hell out of them at that point in time. So that opened up a big discussion about the parachute. So it was determined that it was a nylon parachute, but it was not a ripstop nylon parachute. Now, the reason why Cozy thought it was silk is because nylon parachutes have this checkerboard pattern sewn into them. And if you've seen a nylon uh, you know, uh, wind jacket, they have the same thing. So the earliest nylon parachutes did not have this ripstop pattern, checkerboard pattern sewn into them and they would split open and kill the people. So they were immediately discounted in favor of this uh, better manufactured stuff. So Cozy took one look at it, didn't see the checkerboard pattern, said, okay, it's, it's a silk parachute, not mine, he walked away. Now, the question is, Cooper took with him one of the reserve chutes. And the reserve chute that he took with him was not the perfectly functional good one, he took that one apart and cut it up, cut the lines out of it. He took with him the chute that was sewn closed and said for training use only. Now, nobody knows to this day what was stuffed into that training chute. Could it have been an old parachute that nobody would ever use again? Maybe. Maybe. So... The interesting part comes in here. When we talked to Larry Carr about the parachute, we said, well, where did the parachute come from? He said, some kids found it. I said, really? I said, where did the kids find it? He said, well, he found it in this old junkyardy kind of place with a lot of crap laying around. And you know, the kids kind of dug it out of the ground, they said, but the, but the cords went deeper into the ground and they couldn't 
dig up the whole parachute. So they cut the cords and they brought the parachute home. I said, well, you didn't go dig up what, what was under there? And he said, no. I said, well, you should because it could be the, the, uh, the reserve pack that says for training use only on it if it was from Cooper. And he said, ah, oh, no, 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 you know, no chance that it's that. This was a junkyard. It was somebody threw this thing away. So the question remains in my mind, if there's something I would like to do is I would like to find out where this place is and go find those parachute cords and dig down and see what's at the end of those parachute cords. It's a long shot, but if it does turn out to be the, the, the case for that reserve chute, it would be huge in the Cooper world. Yeah, and a lot of people tend to doubt what uh, Earl Cozy has to say anyways. Well, the guy ended up getting murdered for some real weird things. So Cozy's, yeah, Cozy's testimony has all been discounted. So the question remains, what's at the other end of the Amboy shoot buried under the ground in Amboy, Washington? How could they not look into that? Because the FBI has better things to do. I mean, you really cannot blame them, right? You cannot say that the FBI is, you know, not doing a good job. Doing a good job for what? For a guy that we're not going to convi- convict, you know? They all kind of know that no matter what we do, we catch the guy dead to rights not going to matter. If they come up with Cooper's parachute, it's not going to make any difference at all in the world. And they're going to get criticized for wasting their time on a 40-year-old case where they're not going to catch the guy anyway. So so only the FBI knows the family that found it. I, I keep telling these producers that I talk to, we'll put up a $10,000 reward to find the family and tell the family you'll pay them ten grand if you tell us where the, where the shoot is, right? And that's what it takes to get this thing unhooked and move, get this get this project moving forward. Gosh, I can't believe that wasn't looked to any, looked into any farther. That's crazy. It kills you, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> makes me want to go out there yeah. right now with a shovel. You can, but you're going to be wandering around Amboy. You know? <laughs> Some people have gone out there trying to find the family, and it's mum's the word. So you know they don't want to be involved, and you can't blame them. You know, to be involved in the Cooper world is is can be craziness for your family. It definitely can. I'm sure you've had people uh, reach out to you or maybe even say not great things about you. Well, you know, I try and stay neutral on everything. I'm actually in favor of people having suspects, you know, because even if you've got a crappy suspect, somebody needs to champion that suspect, right? Every suspect needs a champion. You have to vet them. You have to look at them and see whether they're a good fit or not. You know, just because most of them, in my opinion, have not been a good fit doesn't mean they shouldn't be looked at. So if somebody's willing to take the time to to show up and and show us what you've got, you know, we should all be willing to take a look. And that's for the most part what happens, although sometimes it gets a bit testy. Testy. That's a real mild way to put it. Do you ever participate (laughs) in the in the forums or any of the online discussion? Uh, I, you know, not on a continuous basis, but, uh, you know, for instance, I saw the discussion going on about uh, the placard drop and then one thing led to another. So I got on the forum and said, look, I've got this information. Here it is, blah, blah, blah. If people ask me questions, you know, if somebody asks a question, well, what does Tom K think about this on the forum? Somebody from the forum usually emails me and say, hey, somebody's asking you a question on the forum. And I will go and answer them directly. You know, same is true as if somebody emails me a question, I usually answer people fairly directly. Uh, the people that don't get much response from me are the ones that are arguing their case. Where they say, well, my neighbor or my girlfriend or my brother or my father or whatever was D.B. Cooper. And here's why. Let me tell you, you know, well, you're not helping me by telling me. you got to convince somebody else. I said, I'm, I'm not the guy that gives credence to anybody. I, I just come up with a, a profile and he's got to be tied to titanium and to uh, rare earth elements. So uh, I'm pretty simple that way. Do you have any plans to write a book or do anything about D.B. Cooper? Not at the moment, you know, if we catch him, certainly, (laughs) but, uh, no, not at the moment. Uh, you know, I think it would be interesting to dig up the the parachute. That would, that would be, if somebody asked me, what do you want to do in the Cooper world? I'd say, dig up the parachute. Do you think there's any evidence that could be gleaned from the parachute? Well, it's either going to be Cooper's or not. I mean, that would be, it would be one of those, uh, Oak Island moments, right? Where, Where you're digging and you get to the end and what's it going to be? And either it's going to say, you know, for training use only on it or not. So it will be a very abrupt end to a very intriguing question. If we did find out it was Cooper's shoot, I mean, where do we go with that information? He landed here. Well, 
now if it is in a place where there's other stuff discarded, that means he landed close to town. You know, he ended up going into this place and stashing his crap in this place, knowing it would be buried with, along with everything else. You know, it means he got away for sure. You know, you know he got away. Uh, it also moves the drop zone to Amboy instead of Ariel. Uh, now you can go back through the Amboy history and talk to people who've been around Amboy a long time and say, what happened here during the Cooper jump? Uh, it, would, it, would, it would change the focus of everything and maybe shake the tree a little bit. Hmm. Well, Tom, I think we've covered just about everything, unless there's something you think I'm missing. No, you know, that the story of Cooper is an ongoing saga. You know, you've heard about, we've discussed the last 10 years, of which there's really been a revolution in our understanding of Cooper. Uh, like I said, when we first started, if you talked to anybody in 2006, 2007, before Larry Carr came on the scene, Cooper would have been a horrible criminal who hijacked the plane and threatened the lives of all the people on board and, uh, you know, did, did this for money and money only. And now the, uh, the picture that's emerging is somewhat different from that. You know, he was a gentleman. He, uh, he wasn't intending to hurt anybody. The bomb was a fake. The, you know, his efforts were to get this 200 grand and get the hell out and be done with it. And over the past 40 years, he's, he's proven that because he never, he never came, he never got caught again. Let's put it that way. If he pulled <laughs> off any similar capers, he never got caught again. Because certainly if he got caught again, it would have come out that he was D.B. Cooper. So again, it's a fascinating thing. I think there's something for everybody involved here. If you're fascinated with the case, you know, come to uh, the dbcooperforum.com and uh, you can see what's going on there and you can join in and add your two cents and be part of one of the United States' biggest mysteries that actually happened. Oh, yeah. And I've talked about this with several other people. I mean, the fact that no one was physically hurt can allows you to kind of root for the guy. Yeah. Well, look what's happened. You know, he's been immortalized in story and song over the past decades and there's no slowing down, you know, there is no slowing down. Like I say, there's at least two other TV productions going on now about D.B. Cooper. So his story will live on long after him. Oh, yeah. I mean, 50 years later, it's getting a lot of attention still. Well, Tom, if anyone has any questions for you, is there uh, an email or a website they could reach out to you? Yeah, they can go to citizensleuths.com and uh, just look me up in the back under, under the, the principles and uh, they can get a hold of me that way. Perfect. Well, Tom, thank you for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you when we catch Cooper. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Talk to you later, Tom. It was really great to have Tom on the show. I had a blast talking to him. If you want to learn more about his work or reach out to him, you can head to citizensleuths.com. He's got a ton of info on the case there. And if you're listening to this, you have to check it out. You'll find a link to it in the show notes. If you have any questions, comments, or if you think that parachute in your grandpa's attic could be the one, let us know. You can reach us on Facebook. We are The Cooper Vortex on Twitter at DB Cooper Podcast or email us at dbcooperpodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review. It helps other people find the show. Thank you to Tom K for taking time out of his busy schedule to talk to me. Thank you to Russell Colbert, who is also the real deal. I'm Darren Schaefer, and thank you for listening to The Cooper Vortex.